Welcome back to Spooky Pasta, the place where your worst nightmares come to life. Sorry for such a long delay in getting the fourth episode up. So without wasting any time, let's get into our story. I'm a cop on the Navajo reservation. I investigated a killer who steals his victim's skin. By Page Turner 627. The armored vehicle sways violently as Ben jerks the wheel to the side, narrowly avoiding a collision with a skinwalker that had emerged from the darkness with predatory swiftness. Its eyes, devoid of any human soul, burn with a ferocious hunger as it claws at the air where the vehicle had been just a moment before. The flare's ephemeral day fades as quickly as it erupted, plunging us back into the moonlit night. The skinwalkers, momentarily stunned by the unexpected illumination, regain their composure. Their guttural snarls fill the air, a cacophony of primal rage as they prepare to descend upon us. The mysterious horseman, like a primordial guardian conjured from the depths of ancient lore, charges toward the horde of skinwalkers with a fury that seems to transcend time itself. His horse, a spectral entity, seems to glide over the terrain, its hooves leaving no mark upon the earth, as if it were an apparition. With a war cry that cuts through the night, the horseman descends upon the nearest skinwalker. The creature, a grotesque amalgamation of man and beast, turns to face its new foe, its own snarl a hideous echo of the horseman's cry. The creature lunges, its movements a blur of savage intent. The horseman's rifle, an extension of his will, fires with a precision born of countless battles. The report of the gun is deafening, a staccato rhythm that punctuates the night with each pull of the trigger. Each shot finds its mark, and skinwalkers reel from the impacts, their forms briefly illuminated by the muzzle flash before collapsing into the dust, in a fluid motion. The horseman sets aside his now empty rifle, drawing a vicious looking hatchet from his belt. The weapon gleams with an otherworldly light, and as he swings it, it leaves trails of phosphorescent fire in its wake. The hatchet strikes with the force of a tempest, cleaving through the hideous forms with grim efficiency. The desert night erupts into chaos the agonized cries of the skinwalkers clashing against the thunderous roar of the horseman's charge. Inside the armored vehicle, the air is thick with tension, our collective breaths shallow with fear and anticipation. Izzy, her features set in a mask of grim determination, turns her attention to the wounded. She moves with practiced ease, despite the tremors that run through her hands. Her voice, a soothing balm amidst the bedlam, offers words of comfort to the terrified survivors. Stay down, she instructs, pressing gauze into a bleeding wound with a steady pressure. You're safe now, just keep pressure here. I reach for the AR-15 stowed beneath the bench, its metal surface cool and familiar in my grip. I move toward one of the gun ports, a narrow opening designed for situations just like this. My hands are steady, trained for combat, yet my heart pounds with the adrenaline of the moment. The port's cover slides open with a metallic clang, revealing the night and the horrors it conceals. The muzzle of my AR protrudes into the night, the desert's chill wrapping around the barrel. I peer through the gun port, the world outside reduced to a narrow frame of terror and violence. My finger rests on the trigger, the weapon an extension of my resolve to protect those within the steel walls of our sanctuary. I squeeze the trigger, the gun kicking against my shoulder as I fire off rounds into the darkness. The muzzle flash is a brief beacon, illuminating snarling faces and twisted forms for mere fractions of a second. My aim is true, but the skinwalkers are fast and cunning, using the uneven terrain and the darkness to their advantage, making them elusive targets. Despite my training and the weapon's precision, clear shots are maddeningly rare. 
The mysterious horseman is a force of nature, a whirlwind of violence and retribution amidst the throng of beasts. But even as he fights with otherworldly skill, the numbers are against him. The skinwalkers, emboldened by their sheer volume and the taste of blood, press in from all sides. For everyone that falls to his rifle or hatchet, two more seem to take its place. In the chaos, a particularly grotesque skinwalker leaps with supernatural speed, tackling the rider from his mount. The impact sends them both tumbling across the rocky ground. The horseman wrestles with the creature, his strength immense but finite. He is a warrior from another time, battling a tide of darkness that threatens to engulf him. Yet, even as he is swarmed, the rider fights on, his mere presence an act of defiance. His actions buy us precious time, a small eternity measured in heartbeats and gunfire. Inside the vehicle, Ben maneuvers with the skill of a seasoned driver, taking advantage of the opening created by the stranger's stand. We're moving out now. Ben's voice is tense but clear over the din. Hold on to something. The armored vehicle lurches forward wheels spinning as we tear through the desert. I fire off another burst through the gun port, more to keep the skinwalkers at bay than in hope of striking true. The relentless pounding of hooves and the growls of the skinwalkers fade into the background as we gain distance, leaving behind the valiant horseman and the sea of darkness he's holding at bay. The armored vehicle's reinforced body withstands the few desperate attacks that come as we break through the perimeter of the ambush. The survivors inside the vehicle are silent, save for the occasional sob or whispered prayer. The tension is palpable, a thick cloak that wraps around each of us. Izzy's hands are still as she works, but her eyes are wide, reflecting a mix of fear and awe at the night's harrowing events. As we put miles between us and the battle, the howls of the skinwalkers grow distant and the feeling of being watched wanes. But the impression of the horseman's fiery eyes lingers with me, an afterimage that burns behind my eyelids. The armored vehicle finally rolls to a stop, the tires crunching on the rough terrain of the quarantine zone set up at the edge of the reservation. The first light of dawn is breaking on the horizon, casting a gentle glow over the makeshift encampment. Exhausted refugees are everywhere, huddled in blankets or sitting beside hastily built campfires. The air is filled with a blend of relief and apprehension, the events of the night still too fresh in everyone's mind. As I step out of the vehicle, my legs are stiff, but the cool morning air is revitalizing. Izzy follows, her face smeared with dust and dried sweat. The survivors begin to disembark, their faces etched with the trauma of the night but grateful for the relative safety. A little later, as I help Izzy unload supplies from the armored vehicle, a soft voice calls out my name. I turn to see Lonnie, her face etched with concern and something else, something akin to hope. She beckons me over with a sense of urgency. Logan, she says, her voice barely above a whisper. My grandfather, he's speaking again. Her eyes are wide with a mixture of reverence and disbelief. We follow her to a small tent on the periphery of the camp where the elderly code talker is sitting up, a blanket draped over his shoulders. His eyes, clouded with age, are now sharp with a clarity that seems to pierce through the veil of the present into the deep well of the past. His voice, when he speaks, is firm and carries the weight of ancient knowledge. Chester's voice is a steady cadence, rich with the timbre of old tales told beside crackling fires under starlit skies. The children of Azza and Adlihi, the changing woman, walk among us still, he begins, his gaze distant as if reading from the unseen pages of the past. They carry with them the strength of the earth, the resilience of the stone, and the wisdom of the winds. But they are fragmented, scattered like beads from a broken string. He pauses, drawing a slow, 
deliberate breath, the air hissing softly as it passes through the aged contours of his life-worn lips. Nayanesgani, the slayer of alien gods, he who has been our protector, our shield against the darkness, stands alone in this age-old battle. His might is unchallenged, his courage unyielding, but the enemy is many, and they do not tire. They are shadows, slipping through cracks in our world, hungering for life and light. I lean in, hanging on every word spoken. The old man continues, the demon slayer fights, but he needs his other half, his balance. Tobad Zeskini, the child of water, born of the same womb, must stand with him. Only together, when the sun meets the water, can the darkness be pushed back, can the evil be sealed away once more. Chester's voice grows fainter, as if his next words are drawn from a place deep within the earth itself. The waterborn, she lies hidden where the river bends at the shadow of the great rock, where the waters speak and the frogs sing under the full moon's light. The almost 100-year-old's voice trails off, the rich timbre dwindling to a frail whisper, as if the very act of sharing his vision has sapped the last of his vitality. His body seems to fold in on itself, shrinking beneath the blanket, his eyes fluttering closed. Letting Chester's words sink in, I motion to Izzy and Ben to step outside the tent, allowing the elder some much-needed rest. We exchange glances, each of us etching the wind talker's narrative into our memory, attempting to unravel its meaning. The horseman, I begin. He has to be Nayan Esgany, just like Chester said, the slayer of alien gods. That's why he was able to hold off the skinwalkers, why he fought like, like something out of legend. Izzy nods, her brow furrowed as she considers the implications. And the skinwalkers. They weren't just attacking randomly. It's like they were trying to prevent him from reaching something. Or someone. Ben leans back against the vehicle, his arms crossed. So, this Tobad Zeskini, she's the key to all this. The message was clear. Nayanesgani can't win this fight alone. He needs his other half. But where do we even start looking for her? I rub my temples trying to process the weight of Chester's words. The encampment is slowly waking up around us, but the world feels distant, like I'm peering through a foggy lens. Rivers. Shadows of great rocks. Frogs singing under the moonlight. I murmur, trying to piece together the puzzle. We need to find this place. I pull out a map of the reservation, spreading it across the hood of the armored vehicle. My fingers trace the winding paths of rivers and streams, searching for a bend that matches Chester's description. The Great Rock, Ben murmurs, leaning in. His eyes scan the map, pausing over specific landmarks. I remember hearing stories about a colossal stone formation near the southern edge of the reservation. Townsfolk call it Chronicle Ridge, because of the ancient petroglyphs on it. Izzy points to a spot on the map, and look, there's a river that bends right around it. If Chester's words are to be believed, this could be the place where the waterborn is hidden. A spark of hope ignites within me. We need to go there. If there's even a chance that we can find this child of water and bring her to brother's side, we have to take it. The sun is still climbing as we make our preparations to head to Chronicle Ridge. Despite the burgeoning heat and the growing buzz of the camp, there's a chill of anticipation running down my spine. We pack the essentials, water, first aid, weapons, and the map marked with the river's bend. But amidst the commotion, the distant hum of helicopter blades grows louder, announcing the arrival of reinforcements. Several black SUVs, their windows tinted and lights flashing, race towards the camp, kicking up clouds of dust in their wake. Following them, a military-grade helicopter hovers overhead, its insignia bearing the emblem of the FBI. As the vehicles come to a stop, 
Heavily armed agents pour out, their movements precise and coordinated. They begin setting up a perimeter, communicating with each other through earpieces. From the lead SUV, a tall, imposing figure steps out. His crisp, dark suit is a stark contrast to the rugged environment. He flashes a silver badge identifying him as Special Agent Randall, the task force commander. His piercing gaze sweeps across the camp, taking in the scene with an air of authority. Randall's cold eyes meet Izzy's as she approaches him, her steps determined. Agent Randall, she begins, her voice urgent. We have vital information regarding the events of last night and what's to come. We believe there's a way to put an end to the killings. The agent raises an eyebrow. You do? Tell me what you know. Izzy's gaze doesn't waver. We've been given a message, a prophecy if you will, from a tribal elder. It talks about the origins of the skinwalkers and how to stop them. There's another entity, called the Child of Water, who can help in this fight. We believe we know where she's hidden, and we need to find her. Wait, hold on. Did you say skinwalker? Randall asks incredulously. Taking a deep breath, I step forward, standing beside Izzy. Agent Randall, I say calmly. I understand that this might sound unconventional, maybe even unbelievable. But the events of the past few nights have been anything but ordinary. Randall eyes me skeptically, his hands on his hips. Go on. We've witnessed creatures, skinwalkers, that defy explanation. I continue, my voice steady. These aren't just random attacks. They're orchestrated, strategic, and they're growing in number. Traditional methods aren't going to stop them. The agent chuckles, clearly unimpressed. You expect me to believe that some mythological creatures are causing all this chaos? Look around you. This is a crisis, and I have a team of trained professionals to handle it. We don't need to chase fairy tales. Ben speaks up, keeping his voice even. We're not asking you to blindly believe us. All we're asking is for a chance to prove it. Give us a team. Let us lead them to the location we believe holds the key to stopping this. If we're wrong, you lose nothing. But if we're right, it could save countless life. Agent Randall straightens his tie, his face betraying a mix of annoyance and amusement. Look, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but the FBI has protocols for a reason. We've got intel on a group involved in illegal activities around the reservation. We believe they're behind the killings. We're moving in on them tonight. Izzy's frustration is palpable. I've seen these creatures firsthand. This isn't just some rogue group of criminals. If you go in with that mindset, you're putting your entire team in danger. Randall narrows his eyes, his patience clearly waning. I've been doing this for a long time. I've faced all sorts of threats, from terrorists to drug cartels. I don't need a lecture from rookie agent and a couple of superstitious local cops. His dismissive tone leaves little room for argument. Izzy's face flushes with a mix of anger and desperation. Sir, I've dedicated my life to the Bureau. I've seen things, unimaginable things, especially during these past nights. I'm begging you to reconsider. We might have a solution. You need to listen. Randall's jaw sets in a rigid line, his tolerance for the conversation clearly at its end. Ramirez, I'm ordering you to join the operation tonight. No more discussions. She takes a deep breath, searching his eyes for any hint of understanding. Finding none, she nods reluctantly. All right, but promise me one thing. If things go south, if you see that these aren't just ordinary humans we're dealing with, you'll consider our lead. Be ready by 1300 hours, Randall says, sidestepping Izzy's concerns. We radio Chief Nakai for him to intervene, but he informs us that his hands are tied. He has no say over the ongoing FBI operation. Undeterred, Ben and I decide to take matters into our own hands. 
We can't wait for the FBI or navigate their bureaucracy. There's a pressing urgency that can't be ignored. Izzy's face is set, her determination is clear as the brightening sky. She's staying behind with Agent Randall's team, but her spirit is with us, bolstering our resolve. We approach the department's SWAT team, who have been briefed on the situation and agree to accompany us. They're professionals, their faces unreadable masks, but their eyes tell me they're ready for whatever lies ahead. The journey to Chronicle Ridge is a silent one. The usual banter that accompanies such expeditions is conspicuously absent. Each of us is lost in our own thoughts, considering the enormity of the task ahead. As the vehicle eats away the miles, the terrain becomes increasingly rugged, the paths less defined. Chronicle Ridge looms in the distance, an ancient monolith standing sentinel over the desert landscape. The sun is a fierce overseer, its rays relentless, but as we draw nearer to the ridge, a strange coolness pervades the air, an anomaly in the desert's heat that sends shivers up my spine. We arrive at the base of Chronicle Ridge by dusk. The river's bend is just as Chester described, a place where the waters speak. The soft murmur of the river is interspersed with the occasional croak of a frog, a natural harmony that stands in stark contrast to the night's chaos. Ben and I lead the way, our boots crunching on the gravel and sand. The map is a constant companion, consulted under the narrow shade of gnarled trees that somehow thrive here. The ridge is ahead, its surface scarred by the etchings of countless generations. We approach with a reverence that is not entirely our own. It's as if the land itself commands it. We spread out in a cautious fan, eyes combing the landscape for any sign that matches Chester's cryptic clues. The river's murmur becomes a backdrop to our search, a soundtrack that seems to throb with the pulse of the land itself. The sun casts long, gnarled shadows across the craggy face of Chronicle Ridge, as if the ancient petroglyphs etched into the stone are stretching out to whisper secrets long held. Each boulder, each twist in the river's path, feels like it could be the doorway to hidden truths, to the child of water who lies in wait. We reach the bend in the river, where the waters run deep and dark against the shadow of the great rock. As the sun dips below the horizon, the moon begins its ascent, casting a silver glow over the landscape. Chronicle Ridge, bathed in this ethereal light, transforms from a stoic giant to a mystical beacon. The petroglyphs, which during the day are mere echoes of ancient voices, now seem to come alive under the moon's touch. The petroglyphs, bathed in the moon's silver, beckon us closer, their ancient lines and curves suggesting a language older than words. They seem to dance under the lunar light, a silent symphony etched in stone. I'm drawn to one glyph in particular, a spiral that seems to mimic the river's bend. I run my fingers over its grooves, feeling the pulse of the ages. As the moon climbs higher, casting its light upon the serpentine paths of the petroglyphs, Ben and I follow the spiral motif that mirrors the river's bend. It leads us to a narrow passageway hidden from casual observation, a secret path carved into the belly of ridge. The air grows cooler as we proceed. The scent of mineral-rich water and earth fills our nostrils. The walls of the passageway are smooth, worn by time and the elements, and they seem to hum with a quiet energy. Here and there, luminescent lichen casts a faint, otherworldly glow, revealing more petroglyphs that depict scenes of celestial bodies, water, and figures that could be the holy twins of Navajo legend, Nayanezgini and Tobatsiskini. We pause before a large, flat stone that sits at the heart of the passage. It's surrounded by a shallow pool of water that reflects the moonlight turning the area into a natural altar. The atmosphere within the passage changes palpably as we come upon signs of a recent ritual. The remnants are scattered, 
a circle of stones, half-burned candles, and fragments of pottery that might once have held sacred herbs or oils. It's clear that the ritual was not allowed to reach its conclusion. The stones are overturned, and the candles extinguished with a haste that speaks of panic. But there's an undercurrent of disarray, a violent interruption that seems to have shattered the sanctity of the place. The ground is disturbed, the soft earth at the edge of the stone marred by scuffs and drag marks. The drag marks lead us to the edge of the shallow pool. The water, disturbed from our approach, sends ripples across the surface, distorting the moon's reflection into a thousand shattered pieces. My heart races as I follow the trail with my eyes, and a sense of dread settles over me like a shroud. The water is crystal clear, yet as the ripples calm, a dark shape becomes evident beneath the surface. The chill in the air grows more biting as we stare into the moonlit pool, the water's surface smoothing into a glassy calm. The dark shape beneath becomes clearer, and my breath catches as I realize it's a body, suspended in the depths as if cradled by the river itself. The serenity of the scene belies the horror of the discovery. I kneel at the water's edge, the stones cold and hard beneath me. The body is that of a woman, her hair floating around her like a dark halo. Her arms are arranged with eerie deliberation one hand rising above her as if reaching for salvation. She is dressed in traditional garments, now soaked and clinging to her in a grim embrace. Ben joins me, his face a mask of grim resignation. We've seen death before, but not like this. With trepidation, we reach into the water to examine her, our hands breaking the moon's reflection. The woman's eyes are closed, and for a fleeting, desperate moment, I want to believe she's just asleep, that she'll wake up and explain everything. But as we draw her toward the surface, the truth is undeniable. Her skin bears the marks of violence, the bruising and abrasions telling a tale of a struggle, of a life taken with cruel haste. In her hand, clutched with a rigor beyond life, is an object that seems to pulse with an inner light. With careful reverence, I pry the object from her grip. It's a stone, intricately carved with symbols that echo the petroglyphs on the ridge, warm to the touch as if it holds the last remnants of her life force. I examine the relic. The stone's warmth spreads through my palms, a stark contrast to the deathly chill emanating from the woman's body. It's a surreal and intimate moment, the moon casting long, wavering shadows as if mourning the tragedy before us. The glyphs carved into the stone seem to dance with a life of their own, hinting at secrets just beyond our grasp, a story half told. Suddenly, my radio crackles to life, shattering the eerie calm. Izzy's voice, previously so composed, is laced with raw panic. We're under attack. They're everywhere. The transmission is peppered with the sound of gunfire and shouts, the unmistakable cacophony of a brutal skirmish. I press the transmitter, my voice hoarse. Izzy, what's your 20? There's a burst of static from the radio, and then Izzy's voice cuts through once more, tense and breathless. We're pinned down near the northern edge. Another round of gunfire drowns her out, the sound of chaos unfolding in the background. Izzy come in, I shout into the radio, but the only response is a high-pitched whine, then silence. My hands are shaking, the radio slipping from my grip as I struggle to stay calm. Ben's face is set, the lines around his mouth deepening. We have to go. Now.